Okay, well, thank you very much to come and listen to my story. My name is Marije Vogelsong. Vogelsong actually means bird song. I don't know why, because I can't sing. So I choose to have another profession than being a singer. But it's fun to be on the stage anyway. Um, I graduated at the Design Academy Eindhoven in 2000. So actually, um, I was educated to be an industrial designer. And um, while I was there, I was experimenting with lots of materials. And I was making films and I was doing things with ceramics, plastics, uh, sometimes with hair or textiles. Or it's really nice at the academy, you can really get the chance to dive into it and experiment with it. And uh, while I was there, I thought, well, if you have all these materials to do things with, why don't you do anything with food? Because it's just there, we use it every day. And um, it has many ex aspects. So I started to work on food and developed things with food design in first chance. And well, many people start to ask, well, why? Because there are so many cooks already and food is there. Does it need to be designed? You can also think, well, why not? There are not so many designers working on food and design. Um, what about cooks? Um, aren't they designers? I mean, there are cooks that make really beautiful, beautiful things on the plates. And the interesting thing is that when I tell, um, for example, my grandmother that uh, I do food and design, then she thinks that I make these really wonderful party cakes with palm trees and dolphins on it. And it's interesting because it's the first thing you think of when you think of food and design, that it is about shaped food. So I try, I don't even tell them anymore. <laughs> but uh, I hope by seeing my presentation that you understand that I think there is much more for designers to work on when they work with food. Um, so actually I started to change my title from being a food designer to being an eating designer because I think food is designed, it's already there. I mean, I try to design out of the verb of eating. So it's also about what do you do with the food, um, about the harvesting of the food, what do, does happen with the food when you, when you cook it, what happens when you share the food, when you eat it, when you put it inside your body. There are many questions around food that also involve food and design. So um, actually, when I, design, when I uh, graduated in 2000, I thought, well, now I want to be uh, a freelancer and I had my one-woman business and uh, I did many projects and I all did them by myself, so I was uh, the designer, but I was also the dishwasher, I was the cook, I was the uh, person that wrote the invoices and I went to all the uh, projects on my own. And after four years I was completely destroyed and tired and I thought, well, I have to find another way to do this. So I found a very nice guy, he's my business partner, and uh, together we decided, well actually he has some uh, bakery shops in Holland, and um, he said, well, it's so nice what you do, wouldn't you want to have a shop? And I thought, well, what should I do with a shop? I'm a designer. But then I thought, well, if I want to have a design studio for food, why don't I have a restaurant with it? Because then I can have some guinea pigs and I can try things out. <laughs> So we started in 2004, we started poof, and poof is a Dutch word and it means tasting, but it also means testing, like in a laboratory. So it has a double-sided meaning, which was actually perfect for what I wanted to do. So uh, I was living in Rotterdam at that time, and we decided to, well, find a space, put things inside, and have my um, studio slash restaurant. Um, so this is... You have to imagine that it's really, really tiny, it's just 100 square meters. And for me, I thought, well, this is my chance as a designer. Now I just have the chance to design everything in my own place. And I'm also the director, so I can decide. So that was interesting. So um, I really went for it and I had everything designed. So also the, the interior, but also uh, the way things are presented and also the crockery and also the cutlery and everything. It, it was quite a lot of things. And it was really important for me that this place would be like a homey feeling because I thought now I have the chance to show people actually what my work as an eating designer, what it contents. And uh, many people think, um, if you talk about eating design, for example, that you're going to make uh, blue breads with big spikes and it's always a bit scary and a bit strange. 
And actually, for me, the, 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 the food design part about this, um, this shop is um, much more plain and much more about pure food. And it's more the choice of food that we have than, rather than making really strange and, 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 and awkward food. So I wanted this place to be very accessible for people, not too expensive, and um, a pleasant experience. And in that way, they would see that, and especially in Rotterdam, there are not many places that really have good food. So it would really be a place that it would be different in that way. So I also wanted to think about the whole experience. When, when you enter the shop, like this is the kitchen, and this is just on a table where you sit. So you just sit there and talk to the cook, and it feels like things are prepared for you, because that's also a thing in Holland. Um, Mouse kitchen are quite close. It's, it's changing now, but still, uh, it's quite close, and, and you're really a guest, and uh, so, so you're not really interacting with the people there. So also the way you're served was very important for me that that's a part of the design. Um, so this is a picture of when we were opening, and uh, actually it was the first day that we would open, and we invited a lot of people, and they all had a, an invitation, and at the door we would ask them, uh, what is your date of birth? And so they gave the date of birth, and we wrote them down, and um, by the, your date of birth you can see what kind of element of uh, astrological sign a person is. So you can see whether someone is... Uh, water, fire, earth, or air. Um, but we didn't tell those people. They just got a ribbon with a certain herb and a certain color around their wrist. So they sat down in the restaurant and we served them certain kind of food. So as you can see here, this is an earth person. So this person gets um, earthy things, like things that grow under the ground, um, <coughs> brown colors, earthy flavors, a very um, uh, strong food. Uh, these two people, they are uh, fire people, um, so they got burned, a little bit burned food, flamey food, red food, fiery, and also meaty food. <clears throat> and it was interesting because people didn't know why they got this and the other person got that. So they, they started to discuss about the food and they started to question and, and they said, yeah, but you're, you're born in the same year as I am. Why do you get this and why do I get that? Some people did find out, some people didn't, but that didn't matter because they, they were aware about what they were eating and they were having fun with that. And what was interesting for me at that day was actually that um, those people were coming in and it was very exciting and we were opening. And um, we, of course, before everybody came, we made a... Um, a selection of all four uh, different dishes and uh, after two hours I noticed that only um, earth and uh, air people have came in because we only uh, handed out the brown and the white uh, uh, boards with food and after two hours the, the uh, fire and the water people came in and that's really strange because I don't really believe in astrology but I also, afterwards, I looked it up in the book and apparently um, fire people and water people have the tendency to be late. So, <laughs> I don't know, it's just funny to see. And it's nice when you work with food because, because it's really like an experiment, so you never know how people will react to it. So for me, it's not only the actual doing it and the designing it of it, but it's also... Uh, what I analyze afterwards, how people react to it. So it's also like a psychological insight for a little bit. After a year, it was an interesting experience, but it was really, really too small. So uh, in 2006, uh, I could get the opportunity to find a place in Amsterdam. And this is it. It's in a green park. It's really nice with trees around it. And I decided to actually, my initial idea to have a restaurant and a design studio was a fun idea, very landfill, but it was completely unpractical. So eventually the, the restaurant in Rotterdam is still there and the design studio moved to Amsterdam. So this is really my playground. This is where I do all the uh, research, experimental things, a lot of fun things going on. The pictures you see now is, is from when we just started there. We have chickens there, it's really nice. They, they laid eggs in the beginning and then some strange guy put a rooster in there in the place and now they don't lay eggs anymore. So if you have any advice on that, please uh, come to me afterwards. So um, um, 
In 2000, um, no, in 1999, I was still a student at the Design Academy and I was just fooling around with uh, any material and, uh, and then we got this assignment like design students get and one of the assignments was the colour white. So you can just see what you do with that, but that's it. And then I um, started to re do some research about this colour and uh, I started to notice that uh, in many cultures, color, uh, this colour white is the colour of death. And in Holland, the colour of death is black. And um, then I did some research on rituals around um, um, death and um, mourning. And uh, I noticed that actually in Holland we have a very poor ritual. The only ritual is actually we are all wearing black, we are having a sad face, we say we're sorry, and then we drink a cup of coffee and a slice of sponge cake and that's it. It's a very, very poor, poor ritual. Um, I noticed that in many, many places around the world, and I'm not sure how it is here, so I would like to know afterwards if anybody can tell me, um, that food is involved in a lot of rituals around death. And so I wanted to make this kind of um, alternative for Dutch people that want to have more of, an, of a funeral funeral than just the, the, the sponge cake and the coffee. So this is um, my alternative and it's, uh, it's a dinner and all the food is naturally white. So I just went to shops and I selected naturally white food. And uh, of course I was a student, I never had a cooking course or anything, so I just started to make that together. And uh, what I noticed actually that when I put those ingredients together is that all white ingredients actually really match up very well. These uh, tastes are very subtle and a bit sharp sometimes, like goat cheese or horseradish that's supposed to be a bit sharp, but then there are lots of more um, subtle flavors. So for a funeral that's actually a really good deal because you won't want to have like a, a bloody steak or anything. <laughs> So, um, so I also made the ceramics and the clothes and also the ritual of eating it like your hands were washed first and you would eat with your hands. And it's really nice because you actually just share the food and I think sharing food is also, food can also be healing to you. So food as a, for a funeral is, my mom helped me in the beginning and I told her if I would die before her that she has to make it again but she doesn't want to. I was asked uh, by Droog Design to do uh, a Christmas dinner and I actually don't like Christmas dinners because Christmas dinners are all so full of cliches and turkeys and uh, Christmas puddings and Christmas cookies and crackers and all the cliches that you can think of and it's really hard for a designer to find your way to, to, to make something new, something worthwhile. So I thought, well actually if you talk about Christmas, uh, if, you, if you set the Christianity idea aside, that it's actually about being together and sharing food. So um, what I thought of doing is uh, having a tablecloth and instead of just letting it hang down, just to put it up in the air. And this is how it works. <laughs> and uh, it's also my, it's, it's, it has a few reasons. It's, um, one of it is, is my communist idea that um, if everybody's in this tablecloth, you're all, all the same, so you don't, you don't see your, your real clothes. The second thing is that you're actually connected to each other, because if, if I pull here, then you feel it there. And, um, and, and it's also, I wanted to, to let people feel that they're connected to each other. Um, this is what you see when you go to the toilet. <laughs> And um, so the dinner was, um, the whole part of the dinner was um, about sharing. So you can see that this woman here has a plate, but the, the plate is actually just cut in two, and she has melon, and the person sitting opposite of her has ham. Well, ham and melon is such a classical combination, you don't have to tell them, but they will share it. And um, that's what happened actually the whole uh, period of the dinner. So for the, the main uh, course, uh, one person had a whole piece of rib, another person had a whole lettuce with, with croutons and everything on top, another person had only uh, the potatoes, the last person had a, uh, a big um, um, pumpkin stuffed with nuts and everything, and the very last person had only the gravy. So then you do want to share. 
So it's also, it also encourages people to uh, interact with each other because this was a dinner of 40 people that didn't know each other, but at the end of the ev evening they did. And, um, and it's really nice, it's also funny to, to see that unfortunately it's, it still is the man that wants to cut the big meat. And, um, but I don't, want to, I don't want to lock people up in my design or in my idea. So as you can see, there's also a sister. Can you see it? Oh, there's a little sister um, to cut yourself loose. And people actually did that after the main course. And that was quite a lot of fun. Um, because I think it's, it's important. If you want to set people in really strange, in a very strange surrounding, then I think it's really important if you want to do that, to make them feel comfortable. Because, and by doing that, I think it's really important to serve really good food. Because people think, because I do food and design, that therefore the food is just a joke. But I think the design doesn't exist if the food is not good. So it has to be, a, it's a very important balance between uh, good quality food and an interesting design. And I think it only works if you do it like that. So this is, um, uh, also a Christmas dinner, and again for Droog Design. And what you see here is actually a table laid with, with balls and everything. And on top of these balls, there is a big piece of dough. So this is um, a tablecloth made of dough. And these lambs are um, pointing on the dough, and they're actually heating the dough so it gets hard and it gets cooked. So we do that a day in advance. So the next day, it looks, um, that you can see on the right-hand side, it's dried and it really looks a bit leathery, like a skin. And this I did because the idea was that I wanted... For me, if I, if I, if I would say that um, the culinary translation of human beings is actually that we are all made of the same material, but we just came differently out of the oven. So that was the idea. And I really believe that. And because I think... Well, I think it's really interesting if you think that we are all very different, but we are all have to eat and we're all made, made of the same material and we can all share food. So that's the thing that I like to use in many of my, um, my stories and my designs. And, and that's also for this um, um, uh, dinner, because um, uh, people got served the same, the same salad or the same soup, but then there was still always a different topping on top or it was cooked in a different way. So people were actually eating the same ingredients, but every, everyone had a different variety of them. And as you can see on the left-hand side, um, after the main course was served in the dough, so you eat the dough with, with the main course, because we were sure that the main course was a bit soggy, like a stew, so it would make the, the dough go soft again, and then you would eat it up. And then we put away the bowl, and then underneath you can see a little pink layer, which is a layer of sugar dough, which is underneath the dough. And there we would serve the, the dessert on. So it, we would come by with a big pan and put uh, caramelized fruits on top of the sugar dough. So then you eat that off, off the table. Um, this is a little project uh, I did quite a while ago. And, but I still think it's very interesting because it's about smell. And people nowadays don't use their smell anymore. We go to supermarkets and you see lots of things wrapped in uh, plastic. And you buy what visually looks freshest. But people don't really use their, their nose so much anymore. And I think it's interesting because still I think the nose is much a more um, um, important sen sense than uh, your eyes. But um, in this strange world, uh, I thought it was nice to make little snacks that are, are all cubicle shaped. And uh, you don't really visually see what it is inside. And I put them on nose height so you can just smell it and then before you eat it, you have a sense of what would be inside. Um, this is a project um, for Lee Edelkort in, um, at a, uh, for an exhibition called Armour, and it was at a big fort, fortress outside. And I wanted to make like a rough meal, and it's like a ground meal. So the plates and the, and the spoons are made of uh, brown bread dough and quite uh, uh, rough. And um, the food, the, the basis of the food are things that grow underneath the ground. So the, the idea is that you take the things that grow underneath the ground, you put it on the plate, you eat them up, and all the leftovers and the plate, they can be chucked on the ground again. So it's like a circle and it goes 
around and things can go grow from it again. Uh, another circle is actually this project, which I call uh, a food wave. Um, this is a table with 30 snacks on it, and every snack is made out of three ingredients. Every next snack uh, changes one ingredient, and the next changes one, changes one, changes one. So you can just eat and uh, find out your own um, best, uh, best food. So it's like a mathematical step-by-step um, -step thing. Um, this is uh, my most recent project. project. Uh, two weeks ago I went to Lebanon, I went to Beirut, and uh, I did um, a workshop and a lecture there with uh, actually people that uh, work on the first farmer's market of Beirut, and I thought it was extremely interesting because I uh, wanted to collect stories about food and I wanted to collect stories about them. And I, of course, I also wanted to know about food and war because, um, well, obviously, if you go there, you can't go around it. And also, it's very much of my interest to know how people are with food when it's wartime. So uh, I did a workshop with many people from many different backgrounds. And, um, um, well, I was talking to them about actually their favorite food and uh, we called this project Taste of Beirut. And I also uh, talked about them about the war and about actually uh, what a person wants uh, uh, when, when you think about food, when you think about back uh, to your childhood. And uh, actually all of them uh, felt that their family was very important to them. And when it came to um, war, uh, well, bread was, was the, the main thing that they thought of. So what we actually did was in the market, eventually uh, we presented uh, um, uh, a green line. And the green line, that is uh, actually the Berlin Wall of uh, Beirut. It has been there in the Civil War. Um, it divided the, the city in two and it was called the Green Line because uh, nobody walked there for years, so all the plants were growing there and there were snipers, and it was a very, very uh, bad situation. And so we wanted to make a positive green line uh, of bread bowls. And the idea was that all the women, they were making their own bread bowl, and we made them green with parsley juice, because parsley, um, that's, um, well, there's no Lebanese cuisine without parsley, so there you go. And so we made green bowls, and I asked all the uh, people that um, joined for the workshop to write their own story about food in these bowls. So the bowls didn't contain actually food, but they contained the stories and the emotions of these people. So um, the next day we presented all these bowls in the market and we invited everyone to come and share the food and come and share the stories. Um, so while eating, the, so we were eating the bowls together with some kind of cheese and honey. Um, so in that way, the stories would also become part of your own body and about your and they could share their ideas with them as well. So uh, the people you see here were people that um, were there in the market and it was really nice to see that actually the, these people took over my project. Eventually it wasn't it was still my project but it was even more their project because we gave it an Arabic name and, and they were as much as, as much passionate about this project as I were. And uh, down, downstairs you can see them uh, doing all the cooking and uh, it was great fun. Um, this is um, a tattooed pepper. Um, I really like to use words with food because then you can really communicate with the person that's going to have your design inside their body. I think that's an, a weird idea actually. And um, so this is like a pepper. I made lots of pepper with words on it and then the words would resemble uh, what the filling of the pepper would do to your body. So this pepper would be filled with, for instance, figs and goat cheese, because figs and goat cheese give you energy. So people uh, would just see a lot of peppers with names on it and choose uh, for what it actually does to you instead of choosing for the, the filling of the pepper, because they wouldn't know what they choose for. These are actually um, cupcakes with a bit of a lack of attention. Um, <laughs> They all shout, take me, take me, I taste best, oh, take me. And it's funny because people really are serious about picking those things. And, and it's just sugar and, and sugar and cake and they don't even taste so nice. But it's a very interesting way of how you can communicate and how um, people can envy each other about having the nicest cake. 
And I think food is very, very strongly attached to being little and being a child. And um, so I think this is some kind of interesting experiment how the, the child in a person can raise up again. Um, this is actually a tasting about ham in the Van Gogh Museum in Amsterdam. Um, there's an exhibition about Barcelona going on and I wanted, well it was, a, it was an interesting mix of wanting to, uh, because I can't forget my, um, my Dutch background so I made a flower corso, but actually the flowers were uh, um, made out of ham and we used the very best Spanish ham and also a slow food Dutch ham so you could actually um, try them all out. This is a project in Milan with, uh, with elderly people serving because I think it's very important about giving attention to people. Uh, this is the same project in Tokyo. This is a tree that uh, we made that is actually three meters high and we are baking leaves on the light bulbs in the tree and they fall out and you can actually eat them. This was for a physicist congress which I think is very funny, funny uh, client. Um, this is a project, um, it was actually a tasting, so people could taste the differences of the different tap water because of the 12 provinces. And uh, so I wanted to give it like, uh, I wanted to give the water terroir, like wine, like it's really important to see where it comes from, with wine, but not with water. So you could just say, okay, tonight with this dish we drink uh, the water from Amsterdam and this, with this dish we have the Rotterdam water because actually they all taste really different. And I set them in, a, in an empty water purifying basin in big shelves and in every shelf there was 130 litre bottles uh, of water and because 130 30 litre is what an average Dutch person uses every day. So it's very shocking to see that amount of water standing in front of you. Uh, food and sticks um, in Dakar was quite nice for Queen's Day. Uh, this project I want to tell about, this is for, um, for a children's hospital in New York in the Bronx. And these people asked me to do something because their children, they are overweight. And they are very unhappy because they eat very badly and there are only also bad food places there for them to eat. And, but they're also unhappy when they eat healthy because they don't know how to appreciate it and they don't know how to make it. So they're unhappy either way. So I thought, um, well, it's a shame because food can do so many more things to you than just give you calories. It can also give you energy, it can make you cheerful, it can make you feel in love, uh, it can make you uh, relax. Uh, well, it can do many things. So I made a range of snacks in the colors of the rainbow. So you can see it starts from white and goes to yellow and red and all the colors. And um, Leonardo da Vinci once started with this idea about uh, a, a, a color philosophy. So uh, he says, well, red gives you energy, blue makes you sleepy. That's quite commonly known. But the color philosophy also says um, green makes you rich. Um, Yellow makes you to have a lot of friends. Um, black gives you discipline. Well, whatever you can think of. And it, I don't mind if these, um, these things are not um, um, proven. But I do think it's interesting that these children can cho choose for their food in a new way. Because now they can think, I'm going to eat this, and this will make me happy because it's orange. Or I'm going to eat this and it's green because I want to be rich. And in this way they will choose their food in a different way and they won't think about bad food or good food. They'll just be happy. And, as, and in the meanwhile, of course, it's all healthy food, but I don't talk about that anymore. <laughs> so this is actually the same project presented in another way. Um, this is um, uh, sugar. It's cutlery, cutlery made out of sugar. And I really want to have this moment because I always wanted to be opera wind free. So please have a look under your seat. <laughs> some people have like, some people have, this is actually, some people have a spoon. And some lucky people have a gun. Well, never mind, you can, you can look at the end of my show. <laughs> Well, it's actually just what sugar uh, can do to your body. <laughs> and this is what the spoon does. It just gives you no dishes to do. 
Good designs are no dishes. Uh, this is garden press that you can grow in your clothes. Um, this is a 200 people dinner for Philips design and it's um, the food is presented in the long trays that you eat from together and the light bulbs are keeping the light are keeping the food warm and it's only the only light thing in the space. Um, this is for children to um, be happy with vegetables again so they make bling bling. <laughs> Um, this is a project about the Second World War. It was um, done in the Rotterdam Historical Museum. And um, I find it a really scary project because um, I wanted to um, show people what, what they actually ate when it was wartime. Uh, but I never wanted to uh, make people angry or feel sad or anything like that. So I got original war recipes from the Resistance Museum in Rotterdam. And uh, I made little snacks that are just like the recipes. And I pre presented them in boards and they could get a coupon. And with the coupon they could get some surrogate coffee. And then they could, could get their ration of little snacks. And what happened there was actually that some people have actually survived the war. And uh, they ate the food and they got back memories because of the food. They got back memories from the war. And, um, I was really intrigued because, of course, these memories were very emotional and sad memories. But they were also very precious to these people because they have forgotten about them. And for me to notice, actually, that uh, as a designer you can make things that people put into their body. They go to their stomach, but they also go to their mind. And that with my designs I can actually go into people's minds and give them back memories. I think for, me, for me that is the reason to work on food as a designer. It's about eight points that can inspire a designer to work on food. The first one is senses. It's chemistry about what food do, does to your body. It's culture. Everywhere in the world we do it different, but everybody does it, so that's like sex, actually. Um, <laughs> technique, material as a designer is just never ending. Uh, grow, where does it come from? We totally forgot about it in the Western world and it's a very important thing to think of. Psychology, what it, does it do to you here? Um, the action of food, are you sharing it, are you eating it alone, are you eating on your bike or whatever? Uh, and society, I mean, we're living in the strangest, strangest moment of time in history when it comes to food. We're eating mass-produced food, we're, we're slaughtering um, animals in a very, very, very bad way. Uh, we're eating uh, chemical things, uh, but we're also having slow food and we're also all trying to eat biological again. And um, it all clashes and it's a very, very strange way we're flying around the world with strawberries because it's cheaper. Um, so, well, for designers there are so many things to do. Um, so this is what I end with. This is the farting song. <laughs> I don't know if you know it, but this is a way to sell beans again. So that's it. <laughs>